Hello, Goodman Games fans. This is another episode of The Scrivenery, and welcome. This is episode nine, actually. And tonight, we are going to be talking about taking a project from start to finish and what that has looked like for us. So uh, tonight, we are our, our discussion group includes uh, myself, Ed Stanek, your uh, host from time to time, as well as I'm bringing in my better half, the lovely Sun Stanek, who worked with me, uh, was basically co-author on our first book. And uh, we're also bringing in from um, Smoking Worm, I almost put in, gave the wrong name, <laughs> Smoking Worm Publications, uh, Jose Cardoso. And he's going to be talking about a uh, project that he worked on uh, along with Trevor Stamper. So uh, a couple things, other things I'm going to mention. Uh, so our next episode, two weeks from today, which is going to be our episode number 10, uh, it's going to be a, a great episode. We're going to be, it's going to be during romancing, ro Romance of the Cyclops Con, we're going to have as our very special guest, the one, the only, Brendan LaSalle. And we are going to be discussing how to write a good adventure module. And uh, so don't miss that. That's going to be, again, two weeks from today, same time uh, slot. Also, if during the episode you have questions, we'll be monitoring the chat. So feel free to let us know if you've got something on your mind. So without further ado, so uh, we're going to talk first about uh, the very first publication that uh, was put forth by Rayorgan Games, which was the Pax Lexway Campaign Guide. So um, looking at this from the standpoint of how we went from start to finish. So the, the very first point of this, of course, was getting the idea. What, what, what made us think of decide of, of going down this road? And we were, uh, sadly, at the time, uh, we were in a <laughs> Pathfinder game. Well, it was, the, the good news is we were coming out of Pathfinder and leaving that behind us. <laughs> but as we were coming into a new campaign, we thought, you know, it'd be nice to have a, a, a world setting. What, what world setting would we like to use? Um, and since there wasn't an official one for DCC, uh, we thought, well, let's make our own. And then in the midst of that, and as part of that, we were introducing a new group to the game, and we, we, which we had we had been playing with them for a little while. They were new to gaming, but we had been playing. Um, we started in Pathfinder with them because reasons. We're not even going to go into that. But we also <laughs> right. We wanted a um, a setting. We were hoping to encourage them to try their hands at occasionally at running games. Uh, so we were trying to find something that, that everybody would be familiar with. We wanted a world setting, we wanted a campaign, we wanted a map that everybody could like easily remember, identify with. Um, one of the objections to playing Pathfinder is it got to be called homework the game uh, because it took so long to to do anything or do anything and um our friends are like look look we've we've got full-time jobs we this is meant to be fun so part of what the idea and part of like all of the things that we needed when we were thinking about hey let's do a campaign world let's do something a map with our friends let's do something that they can contribute to and feel comfortable enough to run in and then ed said well, I don't even remember how exactly it hit me, but at one point, uh, it just kind of struck me that um, as we thinking of these different things that we wanted to have as facets of a game world, that the Roman Empire fit a lot of these things. It was something that, that everyone could immediately identify with and get a feel for. It had different uh, culture, a bunch of different cultures, a bunch of different terrains. Um, right, right, because that that was going to be another thing that was important. If we wanted different people to be able to just jump in and run, we wanted to kind of divide the map up so that so and so could be in charge of this region and any adventures that happen in that region, they would be in charge of. So we weren't, uh, if we wanted to have a consistent world, uh, we weren't stepping on each other's toes. So that like with the different regions, that was another important thing yeah. that we wanted for the campaign world. 
And to be honest, the Roman Empire is what brought me to the setting. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I saw that cover, BCC. What is that? I have to take a look. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> okay. That's cool. <laughs> well, um, that's uh, that's pretty exciting. So uh, we have uh, uh, we have to address something that has just come up. We're going to do a very quick uh, BRB, and uh, we will be transitioning back into the session in just a moment. Elena, take us away. All right. So sorry for the slight delay there. Uh, we were bringing in our friend Trevor and uh, <laughs> indispensable component. So that uh, we're glad that that got worked out. Thank you, Elena, for getting that taken care of. So uh, yeah, so we came up with, I, I, it just kind of struck me at one point that one thing that fit these various parameters that we wanted was uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, when we jumped into that, we, we intentionally did it so that it was not an actual direct historical copy mm -hmm. because we didn't want to be dealing with you know, people, oh, but you know, this didn't, it wasn't exactly, yeah, I understand that because there's magic in this world. Okay, so it's Roman-ish. Um, and so then once I had the idea, actually come to think of it, we were still in the transition from game system to game system. And I, when I first came up with the idea of, of doing uh, publishing a campaign one, I contacted mm -hmm. Paizo and I said, hey, do you guys take submissions from, from third party writers? Oh my gosh, it was like getting a backhand <laughs> so so then uh i contacted uh brendan and said so what what's goodman games approach with with this and he said oh yeah absolutely we welcome third party publishers here's the process so he directed me and we've, we've covered this of course in, in previous episodes he directed me to uh the the section on the website where it spells out the here's the steps and then he also said look send an email to info at goodman goodman-games.com and that'll get the process rolling. So I did that and uh, we got the initial instructions from them where uh, they said, okay, look, here's what you got to do. Here's the first steps. Uh, and um, so then it was getting started, um, which, you know, the first, so the first thought was, well, what exactly is this going to look like? And so as a model, we looked at uh, existing campaign worlds uh, all the way back to Greyhawk. I have a, still have a co my copy of Greyhawk, World of Greyhawk. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also looked at the world of Galarian, which is the Pathfinder world, which, although their game system is horrible from a rule standpoint, the game world is actually kind of neat, and, and the, write -up, the, the world write-up is pretty decent. So that kind of gave us a, a, a sense of, all right, this is kind of a pattern to follow. You have a section for each realm or kingdom or whatever it is, and you know, within that, talk about the things that are the nature, the, the characteristics of it, and... Um, what what the people are like and so forth and so on and oh we have a co-star i'm sorry she's wanting up okay. um and so then it was down then it was a matter of all right now we got to plan out the scope and uh how what extent did we want to cover what did we want that to look like uh, and then because I'm uh, an organizational geek, the next step was to make a spreadsheet <laughs> because we had three writers on the project. Uh, there was myself. Well, we had three writers on the project and originally we had opened it up to the other mm. family as well. Right. Because we wanted be, before, like I, I, my memory of events is a slightly different order, but before we were even thinking about, or at least before I was aware we were thinking about publishing, mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, this was going to be a group project with our friends. Mm -hmm. like we just were something we would use just right. ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly, exactly. And so we had originally, I mean, I think part of that spreadsheet was uh, that you wanted to open it. We, and we, in fact, we did to say, hey, is because they, they like history and stuff. And, you know, they're geeky is like us. So did you want to take a, a, a section? Did you want to, do you want to mm -hmm. own it? Do you want to make it your own? that that part didn't happen but it was you know well but even with just the, with the three of us so uh, the mm -hmm. two of us and our daughter um you know that certainly is enough people that you need to organize the process and so it was we each here's each kingdom mm -hmm. here's the call the steps that have to happen for each one and here's who's assigned to each of these steps so that there wasn't so to minimize the confusion and then for me as kind of 
overseeing the whole thing to keep track of what's our progress. Um, are we on a pace that we feel like we want to be on? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, and I was going to say too, it, that helped ha having done that already, even though it was the three of us and we are close um, and could easily talk to each other face to face. That set us up for success, I think, with Kingdoms of Africa, which I know we're not supposed to be talking about right now, but I'm I'm now off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. um, because at that point, we were working with authors in Africa. Uh, so having having yep. that sort of organizational system was absolutely critical for that one. I yeah, think. yeah, seven hour time difference. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, definitely getting into that pattern, which then that pattern is carried forward into all of our various projects. Now, some of them have been single author, but even for just the ones I'm doing by myself, I still follow that same kind of pattern just to keep track of that process. So then um, while the uh, writing was going on, uh, one of the things that I did in parallel was start contacting artists. Um, and I, I ran into, uh, I'll make another plug for a Facebook group that I follow called D&D Fantasy Art, which is a great uh, source for looking for artists. And uh, so I, I saw an artist that I saw in there that um, kind of liked his style. And so I contacted him and said, hey, I'd like to commission you for the cover. Um, and again, some episodes ago, I don't remember what number it was. I think maybe it was six. Uh, but we dealt specifically with artwork and, and you know, very detailed. Uh, we had a uh, guest host on. We dealt with a lot with how you, what are some, some helpful ways to go about that. And then we also found for the interior graphics, we found a lot of public domain stuff uh, that was photographs from uh some from some public domain photo sites and then we've uh, just applied these filters to those to make them look like paintings um, i made the maps in campaign cartographer and this was kind of going on in parallel with while each of the three of us were writing for the different kingdoms that we were doing and uh, all in all it took about three months to write which considering that this was not our our full-time gig i think it was a, a pretty decent pace for us yeah, I, I think that was a plenty decent pace for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I tend to get a lot more, when I get f into a project, I tend to get hyper-focused and, and push really hard on uh, on on making it move. So uh, um, yeah, that 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 was, for me, that was, oh, this felt like a good pace. I'm, I'm sure for, for my co-authors, it was, uh, <laughs> would you let off a little bit? Occasionally, but you know, on the other hand, like, um so in our house a lot of things thank you for that a lot of things function that i do the fun part that i'm really interested in and then i just leave the cleanup and the finishing details to ed whether that's cooking whether that's gardening whether that's this publication process any pretty much anything you you he, he will probably very politely attest to the fact that this is in fact the truth and how things run yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I have no comment on that. So, um, so, so then once we got the, the body of it written, uh, then we went through and we each proofread everybody's material uh, at least once, uh, multiple times usually. Mm -hmm. Then going into this, I thought, silly me, I thought, well, you know, I can see where I can just put this out. I'll put this as a PDF. And so I should be set to go. No. Well, and if we were just doing it for electronic distribution, that would have been okay, although it still wouldn't have necessarily been the quality that I wanted. That's when I learned, oh, no, you need you need a, a typesetting or layout software if you want this to go to print. Okay, so I, I, I tracked down um, a program called Scribus and taught myself to use that and did the, the arrange the layout and uh, that sort of thing, which took about uh, uh, two or three weeks. And then once the manuscript was all done with everything arranged, sent it off to Goodman Games uh, to get the approval for publication. And then that's the point where, you know, they kind of go through with a fine tooth comb and, and verify that there's nothing in it that's basically going to make the brand look bad. Uh, going into it, um, Brendan said, made the comment to me, you know, go ahead and feel free to use your imagination. You don't have to stick to the stock uh, DCC kind of concepts. He, in fact, he said, 
if your if your supplement is going to have uh, Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner on rocket skis in the desert, no one's going to judge you for that. So you know, I just put that out there from the standpoint that I I felt a little bit like it was a little bit risk taking that we were taking something that was a little hey you know we put in some rules modifications and so forth. You know, I've now come to realize hey that's what DCC is is kind of all about and and um, adapt it and and. Uh, it's meant to be adaptable and so if you're thinking hey there's something you want to you, you want to put out but it's it's a little bit of a of a deviation hey you know by all means uh some of the other things that people have done uh um star crawl for example and uh the the old west stuff and Cthulhu, <laughs> Disney will you get, <laughs> will get you if you. That's true. I don't. That's Warner Brothers. I don't know if. Um. Anyway, Disney might own them too by now, for all I know. Probably. So yeah. So anyway, uh, but yeah, if, you know, don't let it stop you. The fact that your thing, your concept, is uh, a departure from um, the standard stock notion. Oh, they own it now. Okay, good. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> they do own it. That's fine. Right. Okay. So. Uh, so then the, the kind of the remaining step was had to design the cover file for because it was going to print, uh, which was an, uh, also a new kind of uh, complicated step that I didn't realize was going to be part of this process. And again, that was covered in a, in a previous episode. Uh, and then once I had those things, once we had those things put together, then it was, all right, build the files. Uh, we went, we did our distribution through drive through What's that, son? I was going to say, because I was not involved in that part of the process, mm -hmm. uh, because I am not a detailed oriented person at all. Um, and I don't mean this, like this might get me in trouble later, but I don't think it will. For people who are new to that, I think, and you might've covered this in other episodes, something to keep in mind is there were proofs that came back, like would come back, like Ed would spend hours and hours and hours you know, every night after work, you know, tweaking all this, tweaking all this. And he is very detail or oriented and very much a perfectionist. And he would have it all just right. Um, and then it would come back. And it a as in, we'd get our physical proof copy. Right. A physical proof copy back. And it wasn't just right. right. And we went and through, was, I think, three or so iterations of that. Right, right. I think that those are, are like just, just important steps to kind of keep in mind. Um, that that was probably it was a learning experience the first yeah. one was absolutely a learning experience as these subsequent books came along that process definitely got a, got much smoother I got yeah. a lot more used to it we did eventually have one or two that uh, went live on the uh, or were, were good to go with the first proof uh, what did you look for do you look for in a cover these days style of art color so you know I I don't know that a color cover necessarily sells, but a cover definitely at the very least brings you foot traffic. It gets people to check out your, your uh, material. In fact, we were at Lexicon and I had on, on my backpack, I've got the Pax Lexway cover is, is, is uh, a special shield on my backpack. And this one woman at a booth saw it and just was agog because she was like, she speaks fluent Latin, who does that? <laughs> and um right and uh so yeah so cover a good cover can get you foot traffic at least get people looking into it um i think too the cover when we were first talking about the cover for pax lexway we were talking about we wanted it to kind of tell a little bit of the story um and some of the details in it we specifically were talking to the artist about like mm -hmm. we wanted it to to tell to reflect a little bit of what's going on in this world mm -hmm. what what's the main themes of what we were doing yeah so basically yeah you want it to represent the feel of your system so like the person question asked uh, uh violence diamondism that depends on your system you know if you're doing something that's a basically a cthulhu type thing you want it to evoke a sense of gothic or of uh, of of horror um if it's you know i just recently uh put out uh, mare nostrum which is an undersea one. And I just love the cover that uh, the artist did for me. And, you know, it's, it's the colors are, are great. This undersea kind of sense that it immediately gives you. 
So uh, just something that conveys the feel for um, the environment. Um, you know, I, I found the image for the Celt book and it just spoke to me immediately as, oh, this feels very Celtic, you know, and I felt like it would convey that right away. Um, we use drive through RPG for our distribution, uh, which is great for us because I don't want to stock a lot of books. So they do print on demand. They also distribute uh, digital copies uh, and handle all the e-commerce and uh, they take a certain cut of their for, for themselves. Um, but it's a very convenient site to use. And in our previous episode, we even talked about how you can use that in conjunction with Kickstarter. And we have consumed uh, our portion of the time frame here. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pass on to our co-host, Trevor, who is going to talk with his friend about um, a project that uh, Smoking Worm put out. Take it away, Trevor. Thanks, Ed. As a matter of fact, I'd like to take just a quick segue. Um, uh, um, I have worked here with uh, with Jose, right? Is that what, or do you want Joseph? Which do you prefer? <laughs> no, Joseph is okay. <laughs> Joseph is okay because we've never actually spoken. We've worked for over a year together, um, remotely through email uh, and text messages and everything, and we've never actually. This is the first time we've gotten to actually see each other and talk That's to true. each other. <laughs> so, um, so what we're going to talk about today. Uh, is, a, is a small project that started as part of Tales from the Smoking Worm issue number four, which focused on trolls as player characters. And, um, and, and Joseph um, and I had been, we've been dialoguing back and forth about, about numerous different things, I think. Um, he has a lot of writing coming up in the next eight issues of Tales from the Smoking Worm, which is what we've, we've, we've got him plugged for every issue all the way through issue 12. Um, and so you'll start seeing uh, quite a bit of his, uh, uh, quite a bit of Joseph's writing, which I really, really enjoy. Uh, I think it's a, a great fresh take on, uh, on fantasy, uh, and, and, it, and it often brings a nice original idea to, uh, to whatever ideas we're bouncing off of him and, uh, and stuff. The project in, that I'm going to talk about tonight is, is the adventure, uh, for whom the bell trolls. Um, and uh, for whom the bell trolls is uh, is a short uh, adventure that uh, that Joseph put together. If my memory serves correctly, so you could test out some of the trolls while we were in the process of finishing the manuscript for issue four of Tales from the Smoking Worm. We were in a yeah, yeah, we were in a play testing period for those the troll the tro troll characters that that most of you haven't seen, but they're coming. Uh, we have the printed <laughs> issues here, and we're just waiting actually for for whom the bell trolls to show up before we can ship the whole thing to everybody. Um, because this project actually become much, became much more, it was actually bigger than issue four by the time I was done um, in terms of complexity. So the troll characters had been, uh, we'd been play testing them for almost a year. I sent them to Joseph to get his, his feedback on them because I wanted an outside viewpoint on a couple of points. And, uh, and Joseph came back and said, I, I really like these. And as a matter of fact, I've, I built a little adventure and I played it through with some of my friends and, uh, and he, and he sent me kind of the, the rough, really rough notes that he had put together from this adventure. And it was, it was a really fun little adventure. Um, and, um, and it was, you know, a little different than most adventures. So a lot of BCC has a lot of, um, has a lot of violence in it, but it also has a lot of puzzles and things like this. And this was a much more kind of open-ended little adventure that could go a lot of different ways as what I was looking at it and thinking about it as. Um, and I said, I would love to use this as a way of getting, giving people some, uh, and a little adventure they could use to get their trolls right off and, you know, going. And if you wanted to play an all troll campaign, you could do that with this adventure. And so, um, so we, we, we talked back and forth and, uh, and Joseph was interested in getting it published. And, uh, and so he basically handed uh, his, his notes and everything, which he fleshed out a little bit more and um, had them over, handed them over to myself and Brian Gilkison, who is, uh, that's the core of our developmental editing team for Smoking Worm. And, and Brian and I started moving them back and forth and reshaping them and, and putting them in something that would be more akin to what you would see in a published module. Um, and then we move that back and forth with Joseph. So Joseph, I think you got two or three different drafts, right? We would, um, what do you, what do you recall of this, I, of the process? I believe basically 
Well, uh, you were very right. Uh, the first track that I sent you, uh, it was really rough. It was it was a mess because uh, it was something very, uh, I'd never planned it because when I read the trolls, uh, just to make it short, it was like DCC and Mutant Crow Classic has got a baby. So it was yeah. amazing. So I started building characters. <laughs> I, I could not resist. And I showed to my table and they also started building characters. So we had, uh, <laughs> we had eight trolls in two or, two or three days. So yeah. I tried to create a setting, and because it was uh, uh, trolls are very versatile characters. The thing about the myths is that there is no two trolls that are alike. So yeah, I absolutely. So I, I don't felt that a dungeon crawl will do justice to that. You have to have a more open setting. You can do a dungeon crawl, but you have to do a dungeon crawl like Caves of Chaos. You have to have factions that you can interact. You have to have multiple ways of going because those trolls are going to sneak through walls, go below doors, change sizes, and do all kinds of things. And that's from where the, the scenarios came. It was very rough. It was basically uh, getting in and getting out of a village of humans without anyone seeing. And... Trevor and Brian picked that and they managed something that I really loved. It. They changed that to either an open-ended scenario or if you're really a, a detailed and organized uh, referee, you can also run it as a point crawl setting because you have all the sections cross-noted. So you can let your players like mine go inside the village and burn everything. It was madness. <laughs> or if your players are really careful, you can see the map that they're going to create inside the village. And Trevor did an amazing job. He really created a village. I remember that I sketched four or five NPCs and said, here's a temple. There is one wall with uh, X number of guards. And Trevor, Detail, and Brian, too, they, they made an amazing job with that. Uh, I know, I'm not sure who created the names for the wharfs and the sections of the village. That was really cool. It's I just made all that up, setting. yeah. Yeah, so... <laughs> So, I mean, so Jose had this great kind of, you know, like, like you said, it was, it was like a caper, right? It's a, it's a, you got to go in and get something and you got to get it out of a city. And as Jose and I were talking about it, one of the things that I noticed was, you know, you know, so, so this was actually, so, so all of this is going on and contemporaneously, I'd been talking to Brian about things that I don't like about adventures. You know, at one point, I think I actually said on the Scrivenery, I have no interest in writing adventures, right? Because I, I, I am far more of an open-ended GM, uh, you know, uh, and judge. And, and where the players take us is where the players go. And, and I just respond to that. Um, there are many times when my players have said, oh, we've broken the module. I'm like, ah, modules are there as a roadmap and we've just taken a trail, right? And, and that's not a problem. And, you know, I mean, we, we've, I, I, I take that, I take an adventure as a source of inspiration and some of the ones that we've played in the past, like I remember playing the third edition Sunless Citadel, uh, which other people would do in a weekend and it took us six months to get through it. But there was a whole bunch of stuff going on, right? I mean, that was all character player driven. And so when I looked at Jose's write-up, I was like, oh, this is, this is like, they're like scene beats from a play, right? I'm like, you've got, you've got like, uh, you know, this is, this is beat one and beat two and beat three. And, and this is where we're going to go. And they could go any way you could go, from scene one to scene two, but you could also go to scene three, and then each scene kind of has some sub scenes in it. Um, and while we were laying that out, I started asking Joseph about, well, you know, what does the village look like? And he's like, I don't, I don't have a plan. And we almost published it without maps. Um, and I believe now we have we have Stone Tooth's troll uh, uh, layer, which was I, I just built on the fly. As a matter of fact, right <laughs> here it is. Um, I inked it up just the other day, um, and that was the last piece of art to go in uh, because I had like two inches at the bottom, and I'm like, this, we could put a map here. Um, and then, so we have Stone Troll, uh, Stone Tooth's Lair. We have a jail um, with, uh, with an underground actual jail cell area that, that Joseph had kind of written up that has several really, really cool NPCs you can interact with. We have, um, we have a marketplace which sits within a larger map of a village. And so there's the marketplace map and then there's a village map and then there's a, a temple as well. So there's a temple map. So what's that, five maps? So we have five maps in 22 pages. Um, and, and the village map takes up a whole page. And the reason it does is, is it really is the whole village or it's a good portion of the village. So I, it's in, designed to facilitate open-ended play. There's a whole bunch of stuff annotated on there 
that has nothing to do with the point crawl encounters that Joseph outlined. But if a player goes there, then you know where it is relative to everything else, right? So it's very much an environment. Yeah, uh, you know, I think in environments and and like open ended kind of sand, sandbox type settings. Mm -hmm. So and this so this kind of got to the heart of what I was talking to Brian about at the same time. Like I said about um about things that I that I just kind of have stumbling areas in modules and linear design is one of them. I hate linear design. I'm very much um, a proponent of. Uh, explicit instructions of what happens if players do something, but then let them do whatever, wherever they're going to go in whatever order, I don't care. Um, and so we wanted that and Joseph had delivered that. That was really nicely done. And then um, I'm also really interested in individual um, observation and contextualization from that. And so what we've done with this module is we've left all of the descriptions of the locations relatively absent from the adventure intentionally. There are maps, the GM, the judge can see the maps, they can see what things look like, and then they can describe them as they want. And there's, you can write notes in the margins and it's left like that. There are places to annotate things um, as you want and, uh, and everything. And then we also, we were looking for a way to make quick visual connections. So I think I've talked about this in the past, Ed. Um, I, we, I'm resurrecting uh, the 13th century um, um, punctuation called uh, manicules you see them all over today you just don't know what they are they're like on their postage stamps and everything they're the finger pointing symbol mm -hmm. and so we have manicules that um that hold cards so here's actually one of the cards and so it'll be holding like a card right wrong hand it'll be holding a <laughs> card and pointing and uh and and then the card is blank and then i can put things on the card like in, in this case if there's two things that are linked i point you back to the different sub scenes you know this is seen that like a scene two one may have a little note that says hey this scene three four and that means that in scene three four whatever's in this paragraph connects to that it's a visual cue for the judge to go wait a minute there's something here that's important and i may have had you know they may have killed an npc they may have stolen an item they may have done something right that impacts what happens later in that in that scenario once they get to that potentially and so those are there um, and things like that. So there's a lot of these things. And for whom the bell trolls in the hangman's garden, which is the Kickstarter we just finished, um, which is smoking worm monograph number two, um, they're monographs. They're they're intended to explore how I care about writing scenarios and adventures, and the information that the judge needs to see, but also this conversation about what the player needs to see this different. And so so Joseph, um, very early on. I pegged uh, an artist by the name of John Cobb. Um, here's a piece of his art. This is, uh, this is Stone Tooth, the troll. And, um, and there's 18 of these cards um, and in, the, in the adventure. And so what we did was we intentionally took this art and while the judge can see part of it, they, they can see a little circle with the face where Stone, Tools, Stone Tooth's uh, um, stats are and everything. So you know what NPCs you're dealing with, what adversaries are on a given scene. Um, it's very minimal. And then, and then we created these, these tarot size cards that have stone tooth's abbreviated information on the back and then a picture of stone tooth. So I can just hold it up and say, this is, this is who you see. This mm -hmm. is the person. And so all of the art is designed and focused for design utility. It maximizes what the judge needs to know. If it's in the booklet, it maximizes what the player needs to know. And, 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 and we make it available to the player as, a, as something that the player can you know, consume without being exposed to the rest of the booklet, right? Um, and stuff. So there's, there's the, this is the conversation that's going on behind everything that Joseph and I are doing when we're, when we're working this all out uh, and stuff. I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, why is it that we're laying this out this way? And so this is one of the, this is the one time that I did not just give the files to my daughter, Caitlin Stamper, and say, go wild and lay it out how you want it. Um, I actually took it and said, okay, I want to do the rough pass on it so I can explain to you visually what it is that I'm trying to achieve with this layout. And, uh, and then Caitlin went in and fixed all my mistakes. That's, that's how that worked. <laughs> so, um, you know, what was that process like for you, Joseph? I mean, you know, you kept getting, I, I would send him, I, I, hopefully I communicated enough. He would get uh, text messages and he would get emails and I would send him pictures 
as these were being sketched, he was the first person to see all the different adversaries and stuff and, and everything. Yeah. So, so there was a, a pretty, hopefully a good communication. What was your, what was your take on all that? The communication was great. It was my first time working with uh, an editor and a developer. And that's, oh, that, that makes your work become something else. It's something yeah. that's amazing. Uh, there are a lot of blind spots that you have that you never see. And there are places where the adventure can grow that you never imagine. For example, the jail. The jail was from Trevor telling to me, well, they're going to jail. What's going to happen to jail? And I never gave thought to that. Perhaps because my players burned the town, but yeah. So, <laughs> so that was really great. And the art was amazing because of the minimalist layout. It's something that use every part of the book. It's when you see it, it's going to be, it's crazy. And it's, it's great because uh, it doesn't lose space describing the NPCs. You just have a small art in the book. And that is from John Cobb. I'm a huge fan from the 90s when I play Star Teller. So uh, yeah. finally, see John Cobb writing, uh, illustrating something that I wrote. It's, uh, it's amazing. And it's oh, great yeah. because- Absolutely. It, it, yeah, and it gave me a total different flavor for the adventure. When I wrote it the first time, I'm going to be honest, uh, I'm not very inspirational. When I imagined the place, I was basically seeing the 13th Warrior with Antonio Bandeiras. And Yeah, what, I can see that. And what Cobb illustrated, it's something more weird, more DCC. It's kind of a mix of uh, modern age and medieval. And everything seems a bit crazy or surreal. So it, it gives a different flavor to the adventure. I really love that work too. So yeah, that process of talking with Trevor back and forth and the art, it really helped a lot. And uh, the last time that I wrote an adventure, it was like 15 years ago. I don't write adventures usually. And now I love it. I even I'm even bugging Trevor with a second adventure already because the process was really great. It's yeah, a, it, yeah, yeah. And, and and I really enjoyed it too. So I found that I actually enjoyed this far more than I thought I would. Uh, and the same thing is true with the sequel with Hangman's Garden. I was working with Dieter Zimmerman on that. Um, for that. Yeah, the process is uh, is much more enjoyable than I ever thought it would be. Um, here's an example. So. We actually, I built the, uh, we, um, we built the maps for the village. This is the rough sketch. And what I literally did was I took uh, Google Earth and I went around the earth and found a piece of environment that looked fun. This is actually a fjord in Norway. Um, and, and while the map doesn't follow 92% of it, except the, the, the coastline, I was like, I just needed something that was organic and that I didn't build to build off of. And so this was my rough sketch. Uh, of what that should look like and everything and stuff. And it, when you when you see this in the adventure, um, what we have turned this into is is far superior to what this sketch looks like. But the cool thing is, is if you look really close, this is the marketplace right down here, right? This little spot right here is the marketplace. So all I did was take that and go to a photocopier and print it out and then and then and then draw over it um to get the actual marketplace and it matches perfectly right and then i added detail layers to that and stuff and so so that actually to me i found um you know i don't do a lot of art i usually have other people do art but i did uh everything except the the stuff that john cobb did in this um i even did in the back because we have cards um you don't want to have these separate and you don't want to have them lost and so I, in the end i bought a cricket you know what a cricket is? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Okay. Oh, so I know what a cricket is. I'm a teacher. Okay. We use so, a cricket, know a cricket. So I had never heard of what a cricket was until I was working with Jess McDevitt on a different project. And Jess is like, oh, I do that on the cricket. And I'm like, well, what's a cricket? And it's, it is essentially a, um, it is a computerized cutting machine that you, it, it's, it's really just like a CNC machine with a, with a, with a blade. Right, but also a scoring head. You can change out the heads and everything. So it's it's like an amateur CNC machine. I plug it into my computer. I draw what I want, and uh, and then it goes in and cuts it out. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to put the um, the cards in a sleeve. But I didn't know the size of sleeve I needed. I couldn't order it in advance until I had the cards in hand, which is why I have a prototype set um, so I can measure things and everything. And then when I got to pricing things out, it was like nine hundred dollars for sleeves for these cards. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing that for for literally three hundred pieces of cardstock. That's insane. 
And so I got the cricket, which cuts things, and I put together, I'm not going to tear this apart, but if you open it up, it looks like a CD sleeve. Mm -hmm. This is a draft two. This is the second size. I did many different sizes of these sleeves, and we finally came to this one, the third one, which isn't perfect because I was working with an old piece of cardstock, but it fits these perfectly. And then, um, and then this will glue into the booklet <clears throat> on the back inside cover. And so one of the delaying points was me having conversations with the printer about how we were going to achieve the stability on the inside, on the back cover to allow what is what started as like 12, but is now 18 little cards that are not so little once you get them onto the, the booklet, because I have a, have a mock-up. Um, and, and if it was normal paper, just tear it, right? And so what we decided to do was print it uh, as a as a threefold piece. So it's it's got an extra piece of paper, fold it in, and then I will hand glue that in myself. And then we have these cool dragon borders. So here's the little dragon border that I made, which, which is really cool, connects to a dragon border I did for uh, my own game world 20 years ago that I had mocked up in Adobe Illustrator. And I was like, this is horrible. And so I laid out what I needed and just started working with a blue line mar uh, pencil and eventually sketched it all out and then transferred it and stuff, flipped it. And so those dragons guard the back page and then the card sleeve glues onto it and it holds your cards. And so you have essentially in a five by eight thing, an open-ended adventure that could be done in four hours. It could be done in two hours. Um, the guy who wrote did the primary writing of the trolls. He looked at it and he was like, oh, if you had the right troll, this would take no time at all. But that would that's like 2020 vision, right? Because he knows what, what it looks like. I'm like, no troll is going to know that. Um, or it could take you weeks. Um, and so, so there's tons of stuff in this. It's very open-ended and, and I'm really happy with that. And it all came from Joseph's uh, kind of embracing of loose notes at the beginning, right? It isn't overwritten to start with. And so that's really helpful for us to, to bring it to a final product. Um, I don't know if I hit everything in my show notes, but we're running out of time and we're doing pretty good. Um, in the end, working on, on this with Joseph has been uh, a highly enjoyable, and I love working on any project, but, but I've had a lot of fun working on this with Joseph. And, and Joseph and I have kind of hit it off. I think we've, we've got a whole, like I said, a whole series of articles that he's been working on um, that really kind of blow the doors off of patrons and give a whole bunch of new viewpoints and things, all that come out of kind of this work. And, um, and so that's, yeah, it's been a great project. And I'm so happy. The printer told me it will be here in the next week or two. And um, they found the paper, you know, all the papers we originally picked suddenly disappeared from stock and, and everything. So there's just, every time I talk to them, there's a hiccup. I, you know, I wince whenever I open my inbox um, and I see that they've sent me an email. But, um, but beyond that, I think everything else has come together well. What do you think, Joseph? I'll give you the last minute or two here. Oh, no, it, it has been an immense pleasure to work with you guys. Uh, you gave me all the incentives. You endured all my craziness, especially my overwriting. I know that I write too much, especially considering the layout where everything has to fit. That's kind of magic how you did that. So yes. thank you very much. I really enjoy and I hope that I can keep writing. Oh, I'm, 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 I see a great, yeah, great future. And this is, this is a really fun little product. So, yeah. And that's it. That's our product. Uh, it'll be done soon. I can't wait because we'll be playing these at Gen Con, by the way. And we'll have, oh, we'll have the right. full production value final products, obviously, because they're, they're going to be done in two or three weeks. So, and I'll be shipping them out to everybody. So hopefully people all summer will be playing Trolls. And Ed, I think Trolls fit perfectly in your, in your game world. Right. You know, actually, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm eager to, to get my hands on this myself. This is on the uh, yeah. really yeah, we, pretty darn cool. The troll article is, has been so much fun to work with. And, and like Joseph said, no troll is alike. There are kind of three or there are three main ones. And we even built it so that they devolve into what you think of as the traditional D and D troll. Mm -hmm. So they have this, um, they, they, they have this dangerous side to their lives where they're using their magical energy. And as they use it up, they devolve into what you think of as a troll, like a Paul Anderson type troll. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, yeah, there, we actually, I actually have a whole bunch of material outlined for trolls. I did not think that would become a major project, but we have uh, four patrons that we're working that we've got in just rough notes uh, and everything. So, I mean, it's there, they've been so much fun to play with. Yeah. So that's so it. In our closing, in our closing couple of minutes, uh, we'll take just a, a moment uh, to, uh, I want to fish for a, a summary statement. Um, uh, what would be a takeaway from the project as a whole that you would deliver, that you would state for the sake uh, of, a, of a new publisher? And the, the, the real quick bullet point that I would give would be, uh, you know, there, there, projects come in different scopes and different level of complexities, but um, pr- a lot of things that, you're, that you would look to put out, it's going to be more involved than you think it will be when you first get going. But that's okay. Don't let that discourage you. Um, there's going to be learning processes that come along the way. Don't let that discourage you. Um, you will you will make mistakes and you will learn from them. And then you'll you'll eventually you will be able to put out your product. And then you'll have learned a lot. And then you can move on to your next product. And you'll have all those lessons under your belt. So that would be the the takeaway that I would have, Sun. Um, I think I working with somebody for me. If I had to do all of the other steps, this I would not have done anything. Um, this would not have been a fun thing. This would have been like, I'll write it and I'll do it for my friends, but I'm not going through all of it to to publish. So for me, if like I just had that one little adventure that I that I ran last year at Gen Con and at Origins, the the Raven Ruins that I still haven't published because. And there's a lot of little steps. And if, if I don't have Ed saying, hey, let's sit down and work on this together. Like, what can I help you with? Like, for me, partnering up with somebody, that that to me is key. Especially someone who can complement uh, what you, the, the skills that you bring to the table with their own different skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trevor and Jose, do you want to add anything? We've got about a minute left. Yeah, Jose, how about you? Uh, well, basically, yeah, what's one say? Uh, work with a team. That's the best. Uh, yeah. Especially when you everyone can complete each other and when you are with the creation process if you start wanting a but you start writing about b don't stop follow your guts because i never imagined that from just checking the trial rules everything would come out those ideas so you have to have an open mind with the creative process yeah definitely yeah yeah i i totally agree with what the three of you said and uh, uh, especially that you know, if 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 an inspiration hits you, you should it, you should note it and think about why it's important to you. Why did it pop in that right at that moment? Um, you know, follow that passion, and uh, and don't be afraid to buy a cricket and make things <laughs> Um And so I and we haven't even talked about the fact that this will have a gold seal on this. That's the whole next level. There's a whole nother level that we don't have time to talk about. But um, yeah, the, the, you know, don't be afraid to embrace. Uh, things think outside the box and uh, and take projects in new directions um, and 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 working with a team I think is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, a solo project is is fun too. You know, it's a true passion project, but um, but I really love working with a team and uh, and seeing what other people bring to the table, and then finding that team that allows everybody to work on honing something to to the best it can be. That yeah. that is a really um satisfying very process. powerful right yeah, absolutely all right folks uh it was great to have you joining us for this episode and like i said uh, look for us in two weeks uh we'll be talking about uh how to write a, a great adventure module we'll have a guest host be part of uh, romance the cyclops of Cyclo- cyclops con and uh we're out see ya mm-hmm.